For hundreds of years, the ability for humans to create and use tools was thought to have been one of the key defining factors elevating our species above the animal world. But over time, with the scientific study of nature, this was found to be untrue. The wide variety of animals, ranging from our closest primate relatives to otters and creatures as alien as octopuses, being observed to both fashion and use objects, such as sticks, rocks, and even coconuts, as spears for hunting, hammers to open shells, and shelter to protect themselves. Nonetheless, unlike other animals, the human ability to then take these earlier inventions and innovate on them to create something new is still considered one of the key factors why humans were able to adapt and succeed as a global species, in addition to our opposable thumbs and ability to self-reflect. And through these innovations and the civilizations they produced, it allowed tools to transform just beyond being simple utilitarian objects, but taking on greater artistic and ceremonial value to the cultures that produced them. But as these objects changed and evolved over time, they began to carry vestigial elements of much older designs from the past that were no longer practical. Similar to how, even with evolution and natural selection, creatures can continue to carry traits that are no longer useful, having been outdated over several thousand years of adaption. This can be seen even in the human body, with our wisdom teeth, appendices, and tailbones, all remnants from the early days of humanity. And this was noticed by the antiquarian Henry Colley March in 1889 as he was looking at a collection of clay pottery. He saw how the patterns on these pots appeared to imitate the look and feel of much older bowls and baskets from the past that were originally woven out of organic materials such as grass and wood. It appeared as though, even though those ancient patterns no longer served a functional purpose, artists continued to recreate them in clay as ornamentation for hundreds if not thousands of years. Lacking words to describe this phenomenon, March chose to coin the word skeuomorphism from the Greek word for tool and form to describe how the tools of the past continue to influence the design and look of the tools of the present, similar to how zoomorphism or phytomorphism, is similarly used to describe the influence of animal and plant forms on man-made objects. Today, over 130 years later, skewmorphism is most popularly used when referring to the design of applications for phones and computers that mimic the look and feel of older analog objects in virtual spaces. The turning of digital pages on ebooks, the snapping of non-existent shutters on phone cameras, and the movement of the arms of a clock beyond a pixelated screen, all imitations of actions and sounds that do not exist in this new virtual environment, but which provide the users of these new devices with a sense of continuity and familiarity when using newer technologies. However, just as they can be used to help guide people through a new space, over time, as the memory of the earlier technology begins to fade away, these digital skew morphs eventually become ornamentation as well, as people began to recognize the symbol as its own unique shape, more than the original object that it was referencing. Over the course of the 21st century, we have seen this happen more and more, as smartphones have continued to replace the old quarter phones of the past. And even though these old phones haven't been widely used for decades, they continue to live on as they are seen by millions of people each year, whenever they make phone calls, with the orientation of these icons even referencing the old act of taking or declining a call. Now this act of transforming once literal representations into something more abstract isn't new nor is it limited to the digital world. For many of the alphabets we use today started off as pictograms thousands of years ago. This can be seen with the Latin alphabet, where the letters A, D, and E originated as the characters for ox, fish, and man in proto sinaitic a script from the Sinai Peninsula thought to be related to Egyptian hieroglyphs. And in Mandarin, instances of this transformation can also be found when looking at the characters representing several animals, where the modern Chinese characters for horse, bird, and turtle began by being much less abstracted, as seen by the Oracle Bone script, a very ancient form of writing Old Chinese. Today, the most prevalent digital icons have their origin in the early days of desktop computing. Files, recycling bins, and even save icons, all of which represented familiar office materials that people would use at the time. With the save icon originally being a literal representation of a floppy disk, an early digital storage device that was largely used to store data back in the 1980s and 90s, but which continues to live on as it keeps getting abstracted and grandfathered into new programs year after year. And while the concept of skewmorphism has been used extensively in the design of these digital applications, it has also heavily influenced the design of many analog objects, such as buildings and cars, with several instances of skewmorphism remaining from the early days of automobile design, even today. While Henry Ford probably never uttered his most famous phrase, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. It highlights an important concern when introducing new innovations to the public. People need to be first presented with familiar concepts and ideas in order to understand and accept newer technologies. And many early automobile designers and inventors were aware of this fact. So before and after the mass production of the Model T, they chose to imitate the look and feel of traditional wooden carriages to the extent that the two were nearly indistinguishable at a first glance, with some designers even going so far as to invent mechanical horses 
or to stick horses' heads back on to these now horseless carriages. With this approach largely being aimed at the general public, to make the new technology appear more approachable, in order to ease the public from using horses, which have been the dominant form of human transportation since ancient times, to now using new mechanical cars. Over the next 150 years, as cars became much more popular, propelled by engineering and changing fashions, automobile designers became freer to more openly experiment. Cars soon became sleeker, faster, and much more advanced, leading them to lose many of their early skeuomorphisms, as they gradually began to take on the shape of the modern car that we all recognize today. However, despite all these changes, carriages still continue to influence the design of modern-day cars, such as how hubcaps still reference the spokes of old carriage wheels. Today, with increased interest in environmentalism and more sustainable forms of energy, many people have begun to move away from buying or using traditional gasoline-powered cars, and have instead opted towards investing in more public transportation and buying newer electric vehicles. However, the challenge of introducing these new innovations to the general public in a way that still feels approachable still remains. And this is particularly evident with electric cars, for even though the new technology has freed up inventors to design the car of the future, designers of EVs still often maintain the standard silhouette that most people are familiar with, with the most notable relic being that of the empty front hood that often acts as a second trunk. This is a result of freeing up the space once taken up by the engine, now that most EVs are powered by rechargeable batteries that are placed beneath the seating area. But many designers even go beyond that by continuing to include the large exhaust grills and even programming sounds that recreate the noise from a non-existent engine starting up. Even the way in which many electric cars are charged is done to mimic the action of pumping gasoline, so that anyone outside of New Jersey will think that this is just another car that happens to use electricity instead of gas, when in reality, these are two radically different technologies that just happen to be marketed to the public in the same form. Nonetheless, as the popularity of electric cars has continued to increase, newer designs have also begun to branch out and become much more unique. This is most clearly seen with vehicles like the more geometric and low-poly Tesla Cybertruck, which has started to push the boundaries of what typical electric vehicles have to look like. For a great deal of Western architecture, the greatest stylistic influence is said to have come from the Greeks. With classical elements of the column, entablature, and gable being found across the world, on buildings ranging from ancient governmental palaces of Europe, the mansions of America, to funeral homes in Japan, across hundreds if not thousands of years. And although this style has been replicated, redefined, and even parodied, the design of those original Greek temples are still considered some of the most important buildings that humanity has ever produced, not only because of the great impact they have had on the world of design, but also due to their mathematical perfection, as defined by principles such as the Golden Ratio. However, even though this is a justification often used by classicists, it's not actually true, as many ancient buildings, including the Parthenon, don't actually fit into this mathematical ideal with the proportions of the Parthenon most likely having their origin in something much older and more practical. When the first Greek temples were built in ancient times, they were originally made out of wood, not stone. But over several hundred years, stones gradually began to be used instead, until, eventually, most temples began to be built out of limestone and marble, leading the once necessary wooden structures to transform into the classical stone ornamentation that we are familiar with today. With elements like modillions, triglyphs, and even metopes, thought to be the remnants of the first wooden beams and supports that made up the earlier wooden structures. And this transformation of older structural elements into aesthetics or decoration can also be seen in more recent architectural movements, such as the Gothic Revival, where although it attempts to project a much older medieval facade, movements such as Victorian or Collegiate Gothic exist very much as a modern historical style. The original Gothic style emerged as a result of a series of structural innovations during the Middle Ages through the use of the pointed arch, double barrel vaults, and the flying buttress. This allowed medieval engineers to better distribute the weight of the building, freeing up builders and masons to then design taller and thinner structures with great air and light, as opposed to the earlier Romanesque buildings, which were much thicker and squatter. And while many Gothic Revival buildings used the same medieval imagery, even going as far as to include stained glass and ornamental sculpture, unlike the originals, these are not the result of the structure of the building. Instead, many new Gothic buildings are often built using very modern reinforced steel and concrete frameworks, with the Gothic aesthetic merely being added on later in order to sell the image of the building as being much older than it actually is, or to fit in with the public's general expectation of what churches and colleges should look like. This can be seen at several elite schools in the US, such as Princeton, Wash U, and Yale, where many of the old Gothic buildings aren't even 100 years old yet, and were instead built to mimic the look of much older and more prestigious universities in England, most notably Cambridge and Oxford. 
We don't know what types of skew morphs will emerge next, and this video has just scratched the surface of those that currently exist. So let me know what some of your favorites are by tapping on your computer or phone keyboards, whose layout originally came from the typewriter. And as always, let me know if there's anything I missed. Thanks to my very first patron, Ontroid, who joined the Koenkai level, and who voted in the very first topic poll for the video coming out next. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you next time.